Greetings and welcome from the League of Women Voters of Portland. I'm Debbie Kay, President of the Portland League. I hope you are all continuing to manage the challenges of COVID as best possible. As we begin tonight's program, I want to offer a land acknowledgement because tonight's panel discussion centers on home in this place where home was taken away from so many, including the Native Americans who have lived here for so long. The Portland metro area rests on traditional village sites of the Multnomah, Wasco, Cowlitz, Kathlamet, Kathlamet Clackamas, Bands of Chinook, Tualatin, Kalapuya, Molala, and many other tribes who made their homes along the Columbia River and its tributaries. We thank the descendants of these tribes for being the original stewards and protectors of these lands for thousands of years. We recognize the systemic policies of genocide, relocation, and assimilation that still impact many Indigenous and Native American families today. We want to recognize that Portland today is a community of many diverse Native peoples who continue to live and work here. We respectfully acknowledge and honor all Indigenous communities, past, present, and future, and are grateful for their ongoing and vibrant presence. The League of Women Voters is dedicated to making democracy work. One of our core beliefs is that democracy functions best when voters are informed about issues and engaged in their communities. For that reason, we present programs like this to give our Portland and Multnomah County neighbors the opportunity to think about the issues that affect all of our lives and well being. Thank you for joining this program today. While we expected four speakers, Rachel Solitaroff, the president of Central City Concern, was unfortunately and suddenly unavailable. We have three expert speakers from organizations that are committed to addressing our homelessness crisis. We're eager to help the public learn about these organizations' programs because we learned last year from DHM research that 34% of Portland area voters said homelessness is the most important issue facing our community. Our media partner, Metro East Community Media, records our civic education panels and voter education presentations and rebroadcast them on community access channels. Please tell your friends and family to watch this program when it becomes available through our website, lwvpdx.org. It will probably be available on Friday. The League is grateful for support from the Carol and Velma Sailing Foundation, the League of Women Voters of Portland Education Fund, and from Metro East Community Media. We thank our speakers, the moderator and Civic Education Committee Chair, Nancy Donovan, and all the League volunteers who join their, who donate their time and expertise to bring these programs to you. And now I'd like to introduce our moderator for tonight's program, League member, esteemed colleague, and former Transition Projects Executive Director, Doreen Binder. Thank you, Doreen. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Debbie. Um, and Nancy, I'm gonna say another thank you to Nancy. You've done an incredible job, Nancy Donovan. Um, and I wanna thank our new, our panel tonight. We have, instead of as four, as Debbie said, we have three accomplished housing advocates and they're going to talk about their organizations and how they're addressing the homeless crisis right now. Each speaker will have around 15 minutes for their remarks um, before we open up the to a panel discussion and questions. So Mark, I'd like you to, Mark is our first speaker tonight, Mark Jolin, Executive Director of the Multnomah County Joint Office of Homeless Services. He leads an initiative, a home for everybody, everyone, who, uh, which, is in, which involves officials from Multnomah County, the city of Portland, the city of Gresham, business leaders, social services, and other service groups that collaborate on finding new resources and strategies to end homelessness. Mark, we'd love to hear what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Doreen. Um, it's good to be here. Nice to see you. Um, I appreciate having a few minutes to talk tonight. Um, and I, I will try to be brief. Uh, I know we have a big audience and I wanna um, make sure there's 
lots of time for questions. Um, I'm happy to try to answer those. So uh, just briefly a bit about the joint office. Doreen mentioned that, that we're actually a government office. Uh, we were created about four and a half years ago by the city of Portland and Multnomah County to try to unite the funding that both of those jurisdictions had been putting into various efforts to address homelessness in the community in one office with one staff with a shared vision, a shared set of values around ending homelessness in an effort to streamline the work, to make the work more efficient and more effective, to improve our partnerships with um, what today is a network of more than 40 different nonprofit organizations that, that we contract with for, for a range of services. Um, so our, our core function is to be the, the provider of public dollars, locally generated public dollars to, to a network of nonprofit organizations um, that deliver a full range of services to people experiencing homelessness or who've moved into housing and without support services and rent assistance might lose that housing. We serve the folks um, that are often um, first thought of when we talk about homelessness, people who are experiencing long-term or chronic homelessness are very visible on our, on our streets, um, but the work extends well beyond that. So we have systems of care in this community that, that provide outreach and rent assistance and support services to survivors of domestic violence and assist them with that full range of assistance that they may need to, to get back into permanent housing. We have a system of care that is focused on youth um, from under the age of 18 up through the age of 24. Um, that system, like the others, includes outreach, um, engagement to connect with people um, as their needs emerge, um, shelter services, housing assistance, and then support services, wraparound services to help, help those youth get stable in housing and, and move forward. We have a similar system for families with children, um, many of the same components, but focused on, on uh, families. And then of course, a network of, of providers and services for adults, including um, adults who are struggling with significant behavioral health challenges, mental health and substance use disorder, as well as a system of care for, for veterans. All told, um, on any given night, uh, the number of people who are receiving support in our community through the network of nonprofits that we provide funding to exceeds 12,000 people. So that's people who are either in shelter and on, on any given night, there are upwards of 2,000 people in one of our emergency shelters in one of those systems. Um, but the vast majority of those folks are actually in housing. Um, they have worked with those nonprofits to transition off the streets through shelter or directly into permanent housing um, and are getting the support services and rent assistance that they need to, to remain there. Um, the, the additional work, and Doreen mentioned this, that the office is responsible for is a lot of the coordination of planning work that happens in our community. The a Home for Everyone initiative is just that. It is an initiative. It's been going on for a little over five years. And it is our collective effort to identify the best practices, align resources, and end homelessness for as many people in our community as we possibly can each year. When we started the initiative uh, a little over five years ago, as a community, we were helping about 4,000 people a year exit homelessness and return to, to permanent housing. Um, we're now upwards of about 8,000 people a year who were able to help make that transition. There's been a dramatic increase in, in our communities efforts and capacity to help people um, get back into housing. We've significantly expanded shelter over the last four years. We went about a decade in our community without creating new publicly funded shelter. Um, we've added uh, over 750 new beds of shelter capacity, more than doubled the overall capacity in our community and really diversified the range of shelter offerings that we have available. We have larger congregate shelters. We have village model shelters in our community. And we continue to try to expand the range of offerings um, that, that our providers uh, are supporting in, out in the community. There is, um, throughout all of the work that we do in our office and um, through A Home for Everyone, a recognition that racism continues to be one of the primary drivers of rates of homelessness in our community for communities of color. We see significant overrepresentation for multiple communities of color in the homeless population. 
there are structural drivers in, in the employment systems, in our healthcare systems, education systems, housing market that are disproportionately adversely affecting people of color. That, that is driving larger numbers of people of color into homelessness um, every single year. And those same barriers, those same institutional, those forms of institutional racism are keeping folks of color on the streets longer. Those are all additional barriers. And so as much as we invest in a set of strategies around outreach and shelter and housing, we also work with culturally specific providers and our majority culture providers to make sure that their strategies uh, are reaching those overrepresented communities of color um, at, at every level. So in terms of how, how this connection to services happens, how shelter is offered and how housing services are, are delivered in our community. The, um, I, I think what I wanna talk just a little bit about because uh, we've been in COVID here um, is the response we've had uh, to undertake to address COVID-19 and its impact on people experiencing homelessness. Um, and then I wanna talk a little bit about the Metro supportive housing measure. Um, the fact that they're happening at the same time uh, is, is, um, uh, is noteworthy because COVID has put an unprecedented level of strain um, on folks who are experiencing homelessness and houselessness in our community and on all of the organizations that are set up and work so hard to try to provide support to those, to those people. Um, and at the same time with the Metro measure uh, that I'll talk more about, we have this amazing opportunity in our community to scale out some of the strategies that we know will work to reduce the number of people who are experiencing long-term homelessness in our community, struggling with behavioral health challenges, um, and also those folks who are experiencing homelessness more episodically um, or are just on the verge of becoming homeless if we can't assist them. So I will, I will uh, sort of talk briefly about both of those. On the COVID side, um, when the pandemic started in March, um, there was a lot of recognition early on here and cities around the country that among the highest risk populations would be those people who are experiencing homelessness starting with the fact that they didn't have the ability to shelter in place, to stay home, to stay safe. And that was the message. And then we also know about people experiencing homelessness that, that they tend to be older. They have significant underlying health conditions at much higher rates than the general population. And as I said before, a much higher percentage of people experiencing homelessness are in the BIPOC community. And we know that the adverse impacts of COVID are disproportionately affecting people of color, both in terms of health consequences and economic consequences. And so um, in partnership with the nonprofits in, in our community that, that do this work and our public health division, early on, um, we set up a series of strategies to try to keep people as safe as possible from COVID. It started with a massive coordinated outreach effort to all the people who are unsheltered to help them have the safety equipment, the tents and sleeping bags, and the PPE that they would need to separate and stay safe and keep their immune systems as strong as possible if they were going to be outside. Um, then we turned to our congregate shelter settings where we knew there was a large amount of risk for, for people. Those congregate shelters have 120 people in them in normal times, as many as, some are a little bit smaller, but they're living in very close quarters in bunk, um, uh, bunk beds and, and, and pretty, pretty tightly packed in. And we knew what that could mean for, for people in terms of a risk not just of individual infection, but of outbreak. And so we started by, by essentially removing, uh, um, moving about half of the people out of all of our congregate shelters so that they could uh, physically distance inside those spaces. And of course, we didn't wanna lose the, the critical sheltering resource that, that folks need. And so we created a number of new spaces to make up for the, the smaller number of people we could have in the existing spaces. And then we worked um, over time to transition those highest risk people, um, people with, who are older and have the underlying health conditions and folks from communities of color actually out of congregate shelter altogether and into motels. We now have eight different motels that we are operating as non-congregate shelter settings. Six of those are for the highest risk individuals. It's about 300 rooms um, in our community. So that's keeping folks from getting COVID in the first place. And we're operating two motels with 120 combined rooms that are for people who've become sick. Because we know 
that whether it's in an encampment or somebody who is um, in one of our congregate settings or in one of our high-risk motels, if they become symptomatic, if they become COVID positive, we have to exit them from that space as quickly as possible to keep everybody else safe. And they need a safe place to be while they get well until they can be medically cleared to go back to, to where they were staying before. So, um, so we have two of those, what we call voluntary isolation motels in place. And that's been an absolutely critical resource because as, as good a job in our community um, has fared better so far in terms of the numbers of positive cases in, in the community of people experiencing homelessness. When I last checked last week, we'd had a total of about 160 people who had confirmed uh, had positive tests who had been homeless at some point in the last year. But we've not seen any of the large scale outbreaks um, in, in our shelter settings um, or in our encampments that other communities have seen. Um, and it's at least in part because of that, that sort of um, infrastructure of support that we've been able to build. At this point, if someone comes to one of our congregate shelters and is showing symptoms of COVID, um, they, a call is made by the shelter operator, an AMR uh, person, that's the uh, ambulance service, they go out and they administer a test on site immediately. And if someone's positive, they immediately get to go to the voluntary isolation hotel. So that, that work, um, and you've got folks on the phone who can talk about how it's impacted their organizations, but that work in combination with really just trying to support the staff and the organizations that are continuing to show up and do the work they've been doing every day, that's really taken our time um, and our focus over this, over this past year in a way that I don't think any of us could have, could have imagined. Um, and it's continuing to be with us. To be really clear, we're not out of this pandemic. The risk to the houseless and homeless community is, is not lower today. In many ways, it's higher um, because there is more activity going on. The rates, the case rates are going up and our folks are particularly exposed to that. So we're, you know, we're, we're committed and, and continue to do that work. And, um, and now let's talk about the Metro measure. So those of you who are on this call, many of you probably know um, that voters pretty overwhelmingly in, in Multnomah and Washington County and in the region supported the Metropolitan, uh, the Metro uh, Supportive Housing Services measure last, last May. That measure, once it's fully implemented, will be collecting about $250 million a year for 10 years that is dedicated to providing the critical rent assistance and wraparound support services that people experiencing long-term homelessness in our community need, as well as those who are living on the edge of homelessness. The significant majority of that money under the way that the measure is written will go to that population of people who are experiencing long-term homelessness who are extremely low income, meaning that they earn less than 30% of area median income, and they have one or more significant disabling conditions that they're living with. They either are already experiencing chronic homelessness, meaning they've been outside a long time living with those, with those conditions, or they're coming from an institutional setting and but for an intervention with this measure will become chronically homeless and, and need the shelter services and, and other parts of our system. For Multnomah County, ultimately, uh, we expect to, to, that this measure will raise about $100 million a year for these critical services. But to, to give you a sense of what that scale is, right now the Joint Office of Homeless Services budget is about $70 million a year, of which the significant majority is city and county general fund. So we're looking at more than doubling the available resources on the public side um, with this measure. And that means being able to dramatically increase the scale of the work that, that we do, in particular, as it relates to creating what we think of or call permanent supportive housing Right. It is the, the deeply affordable housing, how to, housing that's affordable to somebody who has no income or has a long-term disability check of maybe $780 a month. Um, and then providing the wraparound support services, it can be behavioral health services, employment services, just basic housing retention, community building services, whatever an, an individual household needs to not just get the rent paid, but remain stable and supported in that, in that living situation. We think with this measure, we're gonna be able in Multnomah County alone to add over 2000 new units of, of permanent supportive housing. And I think folks who do this work will tell you that all of our emergency systems, our outreach teams that, that deliver emergency supplies and help people navigate the services, our shelter programs, none of them work the way they should because there's a bottleneck at the point of moving someone from these kind of emergency situations to an actual sustainable permanent housing um, opportunity. And this measure gives us the opportunity to free up that bottleneck, to, to move more people 
through those emergency care systems, whether it's hospital rooms or emergency shelters or crisis care settings and into the permanent housing they need. And so that's what's transformative for us is that ends people's homelessness, that kind of housing, we know it works. And with the Metro measure, if we're good about investing it and we're committed to being very strategic about these investments, we have this transformative opportunity in our community and in Washington and Clackamas County as well. And I, I think it's really important to recognize that the promise of this measure is really in this not just being a single county response, a Multnomah County response or a Washington or Clackamas County response, but a tri-county response recognizing that this is a regional challenge, we need a regional solution, and this measure provides the funding and also directs us to build the regional planning infrastructure that it will take to successfully implement the measure and really achieve the outcomes that it can achieve for, for the folks who, who need this service so desperately. So um, I will stop there and I'd be happy to take questions. Um, we're, Mark, we're going to go through everybody and then come back, okay? Then I forgot to mention before Mark uh, moved on to um, overseeing this program, he ran JOIN for a number of years. I can't remember how many years, but enough. <laughs> he did a great job. Our next speaker is Andy Miller. Andy is the Executive Director of Human Solutions, which builds, operates, and supports families in permanent affordable housing. Before Andy joined Human Solutions in 2015, he was the Chief Operating Officer of Volunteers of America, Oregon. Previously to that, when his children were young and I knew them, he spent 13 years with the City of the Housing Bureau. So Andy, it's good to see you again. Thanks, Doreen. Good to see you. Um, and I'm going to share my screen in a minute and just share some slides that we use uh, and have been using to have community conversations around the issue that community really wants to talk about and that's homelessness. But before I do that, I um, wanna highlight two things that Mark said and it's it's great to follow Mark because he lays the ground out really well. Um, one is um, his, uh, he, he understated the incredible response that his team and Multnomah County uh, provided us as uh, homeless providers around the pandemic. And um, many communities have experienced significant outbreaks and thanks to the great work that his team and County Public Health did, um, we really haven't here. And the pandemic's been managed in an incredible way. So if folks wanna know, well, what are we doing about homelessness? One thing we did was we kept a lot of folks experiencing it safe and that's just a credit to the county first and foremost. Um, the second thing Mark talked about, the bottleneck, I'll talk a little more about that in a minute, but that is really true. Um, and just to give you some data off the top of my head, um, I started at Human Solutions about six years ago. Um, I think the average uh, tenure in our shelters was um, three to six weeks. Um, I think it's now um, six months to a year. So folks are waiting in shelters a lot longer than they ever have been. Um, shelters are not serving the traditional function of being emergency places for people to stay there. Um, people are living in them. They're, they're, they're de facto homes that they were never designed to be. So um, really just wanted to highlight that. Um, let me share my screen and walk through some slides again that we use um, to share a little bit about how, how our organization responds um, as well as a little bit of how we think about homelessness. So I'm hoping you all are seeing my screen. Um, so Human Solutions is an organization that's um, been serving East Portland and East Multnomah County for the last 31 years. Um, we're a large and multifaceted um, organization with 140 employees. Uh, a budget that's grown every year that's comprised primarily of government contracts, um, private grants and private donations make up the bulk of the resources that we administer to meet our mission. Um, we, in addition to human services and homeless services, we are a developer and operator of affordable housing. And again, we focus um, geographically on the part of Multnomah County that is probably the blackest, the brownest, and the poorest. So um, we're out there in East Multnomah County where the issues that we try to address run deep. Uh, I won't read my own mission statement, but just highlighting a few things. We've really shifted to consider ourselves focusing 
um, not just on the people experiencing poverty, but on the forces that are creating issues like poverty and homelessness in our community, um, including racism and systemic oppression. We mostly approach our work through partnership with people and communities and neighborhoods. We invest heavily in affordable housing and other community assets toward building healthy neighborhoods. And um, more recently, we've become um, active in community organizing and advocacy because if we just keep serving people without addressing the policies and advocating for a real systemic change, um, we just become a conveyor belt um, and part of a machine that is actually keeping people poor. Our vision is really all about healthy, vibrant neighborhoods um, because the data tells us that the, one of the greatest predictors of a child's trajectory in life is the zip code into which they are born. So we can provide all the services we, we can to families and children, but if we're not changing the zip codes, we're not impacting the neighborhoods, we're not building the fabric that over generations are really gonna turn the tide. Our services, uh, we really try to provide a pretty holistic continuum of services within our organization. Um, our services start by responding to crisis. We operate three emergency shelters, um, one serving families with children who are experiencing homelessness and now two that are um, serving um, women and people who identify as women. Um, we provide a range of short-term assistance um, and homeless prevention, including utility assistance and eviction prevention. On the stability side, we operate, as I said, in the housing space, working pretty aggressively to continue to develop affordable housing, typically now as part of mixed use projects that also help deliver community space, thriving retail into neighborhoods and space where folks can obtain services or gather um, all of our housing um, includes services for the residents of that housing. And as Mark mentioned, um, a subset of our housing we're able to develop as that permanent supportive housing that really is one of the um, best practices to helping folks transition out of homelessness and, and, and do that sustainably. We also work in the income space, um, a suite of job training and career counseling programs uh, for folks who are ready to go back to work or increasing their income. Um, we have a range of programs that partner very closely with folks and has a great track record of moving people into stable living wage employment. Cannot talk about anything we do without talking about how we center, center racial equity. This is our equity statement and it is really about making sure that we as a team understand the causes and impacts um, of uh, the legacy of this country uh, in systemic racism. Um, and nowhere, I think, is that more, uh, perhaps more powerful than in the housing space, um, that folks who are experiencing a lack of housing security, who are black and brown, are part of generations who have been systemically denied opportunities um, to rent housing, to choose their neighborhood, or to buy a home. So we get asked a lot of questions. And again, these are slides from a community conversation. I'm really looking forward to the chat portion where we can actually have a conversation. Um, but one way to ruin a good community gathering we found is to talk about homelessness because everybody's got a different opinion. So we get asked a lot, um, people call it homelessness, people call it houselessness. How do you define it? couple of definitions up here. The one straight out of the dictionary, it literally means the state of having no home. Uh, the HUD definition, which we often have to operate within for program eligibility or in terms of how we count people as homelessness, count people as homeless is really about um, what type of place you are living in. Um, is it fit for human habitation? And these definitions are interesting because there's lots of folks who may meet that second HUD definition, um, but consider themselves to have a home. It's just not a home meant for human habitation. And then there are folks who may feel like they are um, in housing, but they move around so much they never feel like they have a home. They're part of the housing crisis of uh, ultra mobility, um, which is a real problem, especially for poorer families uh, out in our part of the county. And my slide stopped advancing. Here we go. 
Um, some numbers, um, Mark probably has more updated numbers, but these came out of what we call the 2019 point in time count. Um, folks who are in this business look, look to the point in time count and at the same time feel like it's never accurate. It never truly counts everybody. It has um, lots of flaws to it, but we need to have some data and some ability to tell um, how we're making progress. So these are the numbers uh, from the last count. Um, about 4,000 people meet that HUD definition. Uh, of that, 2,000 are unsheltered. Um, we've made some good progress moving um, folks who uh, are, are uh, counted as homeless um, from unsheltered into sheltered. Um, my guess is that since 2019, especially because of the pandemic um, and, and other issues, more folks are becoming unsheltered. More importantly, or I'd say just as importantly, but sometimes not counted, is that 15,000 number. Those are the folks who really have no stable place to live. They're couch surfing, um, they're, they're living in a place where they're not counted, they're not stably housed, and we don't consider them to have a home, but they may not meet that HUD definition. And then really importantly, I always add to this slide, um, Mark mentioned this, is probably these counts would go up by something like 12,000 or more. Those are the folks um, every night who, because of the interventions of our local system, are not experiencing homelessness. So it, it, you know, often it feels like problems getting worse. We're spending all this money. We're not doing anything. We actually are doing a lot, but the 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 the, the population of folks who are experiencing the crunch that's causing them to become houseless or homeless um, is overwhelming the system and. Hopefully this influx of resources is really gonna help. Um, and then, you know, always mention that within all of these definitions and all of these numbers, our BIPOC neighbors are overrepresented. What's causing the homeless crisis? So we differ in opinion about this. Um, this is, uh, I heard, I think the um, host mentioned that DHM, uh, 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 sorry, DMH research came and talked uh, at one point about some research they did. Um, this is a, a online survey that KGW participated in and we're kind of split half and half. Is it really about the cost of housing? I think a lot of advocates in the system believe that is the primary problem. I think for other folks, it may be individual personal traits, behavioral issues um, and illness that are causing the problem. Um, we certainly see a lot of folks who are unsheltered, who appear to be experiencing significant behavioral health issues. Um, is it correlation? Is it causation? Um, hard to say. Um, my personal opinion is, is that uh, I probably stand most solidly in the camp that it's, it's most directly related to our cost of housing. And when the cost of housing is too high, you're always gonna see a correlation between people who are left out of that system and people who experience significant behavioral ish, uh, health issues. So why, are, why do we say our housing is out of reach? Um, because all the data tells us that it is. Um, this is just a little bit of basic math um, from our partners at the National Low Income Housing Council. Um, you see what uh, market two bedroom apartment costs in Portland. You see what utilities costs are. You see um, average family of four at 50% of median income. So this is the lowest quartile. It's at the top of the lowest quartile of our local family population in terms of income. They make $40,000 a year. That 916 is what HUD says they should be paying for rent and utilities. And you can see they really need to pay almost double that. And so what happens then? Families um, do all kinds of things. They don't buy medication. They don't buy food. Sometimes they pay the rent first. Sometimes they go a couple of months not paying rent to meet emergency expenses. They fall behind. Maybe they get some rent assistance and get caught up. Maybe they move to another place and save a couple months of unpaid rent, but bear the trauma of moving. We know that the schools, for example, in our part of the county experience really high mobility rates over 35%, meaning one third of the kids who were in that school in October are gone by May because they've moved, mostly because of housing costs. Next slide. So for single adults, they don't fare much better. We see a lot of uh, single adults without children on the street. Again, these wages, um, these are wages that uh, national income Housing Council says you need to earn to afford a studio apartment. 
um, or a one bedroom apartment in Portland. These are the median wages in our largest employment sectors in the area. So, you know, often you hear folks uh, who may feel less sensitive to the un uh, unsheltered homeless issue say, just go get a job. There's lots of jobs. Many people do, they try. You can see it's pretty tough to make in most jobs enough to cover your rent. How are we responding? Mark talked a lot about the continuum that we have out there as a community. We have uh, shelter systems for families, for single adults, for youth, for uh, survivors of domestic violence. Um, we are just uh, beginning to more comprehensively support um, do-it-yourself housing, structured camping, folks who can say, I can find a home, just let me be. Um, that's probably the issue that we see the most public debate about. How much of that is okay? It's a good conversation and one that we probably need to have. Um, we have rent assistance programs. Um, I'm a huge advocate for prevention. Our data at Human Solutions tells us for every um, $1 we spend um, on prevention, paying utilities, paying rent assistance while someone is still living in housing, save $6 on the back end if that family or individual was to fall into homelessness. Um, Long-term systemic change is gonna come when we develop enough affordable housing and enough supportive housing. What's happening in Finland? Why am I talking about Finland? We're here in part Portland, Oregon. Um, you know, we often, want to find places where we can find hope. Um, and for a lot of folks in the business of looking at homelessness, um, you'll hear chatter about the Helsinki miracle. Um, so in 1987, Helsinki had about um, 18,000 people uh, who, um, who were experiencing homelessness in, uh, I believe, a given year. Um, as a country, uh, Finland began to make some systemic changes. Universal basic income and universal basic housing subsidy um, became a reality. Um, but Helsinki, um, which by the way is about the same size as Portland, I've never been there, but I've done a fair amount of research on it, um, seems to be a similar city to Portland in size and makeup and economy. Um, they were having a significant issue of uh, of street level homelessness. And beginning in 2008, they made a sustained investment in what um, practitioners call the housing first model. The housing first model simply is unconditional housing. It's housing without conditions. You don't have to be sober. You don't have to accept services. Um, you really don't have to do anything but come inside. Um, and from there, we'll work on the issues you feel you're ready to work on. And with that housing first model, Helsinki did an amazing thing of kind of really whittling away at, at their street level homelessness. Um, they now are operating one 50 bed shelter and virtually have no unsheltered folks. I think they still have about 6,000 folks who would meet that um, non HUD definition. They're doubled up living with family or friends, um, but folks are not living on the street in Helsinki by and large. Back to Portland. So how do we end our crisis here? Um, you know, this is not a comprehensive list. It's probably an important and good conversation uh, that we need to continue to have is how do we end this crisis? Um, human solutions, we believe in the housing first model and we really need, believe in the need to invest in it um, in, in a deep and profound way. So when Mark talked about um, that homeless service measure being paired with uh, folks who are currently living on the street, we need to have a conversation how much of that supportive housing will be unconditional. You don't have to come in and accept sobriety services, just get to come inside. Um, second, we support structured camping. Um, if, if it can be done hygienically, if it can be done in a way that is, um, you know, compatible with um, the fabric of the neighborhood in which it's happening, if it's done wisely and done in a sustainable way, it can be a cost-effective way for folks um, who are able to live outside on their own to do so, probably need to have a conversation about what are the humane standards we would insist on uh, upholding in those camps, and are we building them to be permanent, or are we building them as a stopgap measure um, for a few years until we can build out that housing inventory? Um, we operate shelters at Human Solutions, but don't aggressively support 
the expansion of our shelter system. Shelter is a very expensive way to provide safety off the streets. It's necessary, it's necessary right now when folks are, are not safe on the streets, but um, shelters can, can eat up an, uh, enormous amounts of your homeless budget if you're not careful. And then what you lack are the resources to build the strategies and the housing that's needed for folks to move beyond shelter. Um, having good, humane, well-operated shelters is an important part of any system in a city that's experiencing homelessness like, like Portland, but we need to be really considerate and thoughtful before we expand it too aggressively. Um, legislative changes are afoot to make housing easier to qualify for and remain in. We know folks that are being screened out of housing, particularly folks who've experienced homelessness. Um, we made some changes here in Portland. There's a look to take that statewide. Um, similarly, We've been increasing renter protections pretty steadily over the last several years. Um, we have to have some cost control around our private market rental housing, and we have to have some measures that um, keep tenants in housing and allow people to make their homes in rental housing uh, unless and until everyone can afford to buy a home. Focusing on supportive housing is really key. Um, and again, I would put in a plug for keep doing what we're doing. Uh, as the data I shared before says, it is working. Um, and we now have an opportunity to expand our, um, expand our efforts substantially as, as a result of the generosity of the regional voters. Lastly, um, a few strategies that don't get as much airplay. Um, we are building a lot of affordable housing. It's not very affordable though. Um, too often the capital subsidies that organizations like ours receive to build affordable housing allow us to create housing for the low wage workforce. If we really want our built affordable housing to be addressing homelessness, people with very low incomes, we need to bring more rent subsidies to, the, to, to that housing that's in our pipeline right now. Um, in addition to the homeless service measure, Metro also passed a regional housing bond. Um, it's my personal opinion that that bond is gonna create uh, a nice supply of affordable housing, but not enough of it's gonna be really affordable to address the population. I think the voters think they were uh, voting to build housing for. So hopefully we can couple some of the homeless service dollars and provide deep rent subsidies uh, into our new affordable housing. Gotta think long-term. We, 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 we do a lot of triage in the homeless world, but um, as I started, I'll finish where I started. We have to create healthy, affordable neighborhoods if we're really gonna turn the tide systemically over time. So while we're building this housing, um, I, my plug would be not to underinvest that in it, not to focus uh, overly zealously on bringing the unit costs down, down, down. These buildings are gonna be there, um, many of them for 60 to 100 years and form anchors in new neighborhoods and areas that need those anchors desperately. So. Um, I would not recommend underinvesting in affordable housing or cost cutting too much there. Um, it's been stated already that our uh, black indigenous and populations of color experience homelessness disproportionately. We need to focus our programs and our housing um, aggressively on those populations and get that overrepresentation down at, at all the while we are um, looking to end the crisis permanently. Um, our federal government has to be a player. It used to be, it's bowed out for decades. Um, with a new administration, many are hopeful about a new, renewed federal investment. And then finally, we need to think of housing as human right. We are so often taking a finite amount of resources for housing, trying to divide it up, trying to take a twin size blanket um, and stretch it over a queen size bed. And it just doesn't work. We're always leaving someone out in the cold or we're tearing the blanket. Until housing is a human right, and until we turn the conversation from who should receive this limited amount of assistance to how is the government guaranteeing housing for every American, um, we're not having the full systemic change conversation that we need to have. So I'm going to stop there and uh, again, look forward to your questions and appreciate the, uh, the time. Andy, thank you. Am I on? Yes. Thank you so much, Andy. Um, interesting. I have a lot of questions myself for both of you. Our next speaker is Jeff Riddle, who's, an, who's the Administrative Support Manager at Transition Projects. Transi Transition Projects manages shelters and offers programs 
and resources to individuals through services, including casework, caseworkers, healthcare, mentorship, and housing. Jeff has served as a mentor, street outreach engagement specialist, residential advocate, client service specialist, case manager, shelter manager, and income development program manager. In 2018, Jeff received the wonderful Ma, Beverly Ma Curtis Award given to formerly homeless persons who have significantly contributed to ending homelessness. I'm really proud to have you here, Jeff. Unmute. There we go. Thanks, Doreen. Okay. Um, thank you for uh, allowing me to speak uh, today. It's really, truly an honor. Um, I uh, didn't know what to, to really say during this meeting, but um, as a formerly um, homeless and a person that's experienced homelessness, um, I came from a, a pretty broken home. Um, a lot of mental and physical abuse and emotional abuse. And um, when I got older, um, I decided that that wasn't the life that I wanted to live. And um, I decided to stand up for myself and I left that house and I had stayed in multiple different foster homes and stuff like that. And um, what ended up happening was I ended up leaving, uh, leading a life of uh, addiction because of childhood trauma and things of that nature. And what ended up happening was I carried that, that, that huge burden uh, for a significant amount of time. Um, in 2000, I ended up um, at a child and that child passed away. And I really think that that's what really took me over the edge. Um, when I had to place my, my son in the ground, I, something, something clicked. I don't know what it was, but um, I knew something needed to change. And what I ended up doing was coming to Portland uh, to try to make that change because the environment that I was in was really difficult. But um, I continued to face the addiction and I was introduced to transition projects. Um, I had a picture actually, I wanted to show some pictures because I think that these tug on heartstrings. Uh, so, um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, let's see if I can do this. Okay. So can you see this? Everybody see this? No? Yeah. Oh, there we go. So uh, this was me as a kid. Um, I'm the gankly looking thing over here. <laughs> but um, with that being said, I was really happy. Uh, this was in my adopted family. When I came to Portland and I experienced homelessness, uh, this was me. This was the photo when I was first introduced to transition projects. And I still look happy, but there was a lot of un, um, there was a lot of things that were still um, happening underneath. Um, I did end up um, uh, in sobriety in 2012. I've been so, um, sober, clean and sober since 2012, 110, 2012. I just celebrated my nine year uh, anniversary for that, which is great. Um, so with that being said, since I've been introduced with transition projects, uh, one thing that I really wanted to do was try to make a difference. Um, and as Doreen mentioned, there were multiple um, roles that I had played in uh, one of those roles uh, were um, the outreach engagement specialists. Uh, the funny part about it is they have a whole team of people, and I was one of the first people to actually um, take part in that and to be the pioneer in what they have, their own facility now, just makes my heart really warm. And it's funny because a lot of those people that are in that position say, oh, you're the, you're the man, you're like, you're the one that started us and you all this stuff. And uh, I, I just tell them I'm just another guy who just wanted to make sure that there was something that could happen. Um, with all of that, I ended up moving into housing case management. I was the highest placing case manager in the agency. And uh, I think that what happened was I was one of the individuals who um, understood from a client's perspective and I had that drive and um, 
I ended up doing a lot of housing advocacy, which is this photo. Uh, I'm the, again, the tall linky thing in the back. <laughs> but, yes, they're not moving. They're not, I... Say it again. I'm not seeing another picture. Is somebody... Uh-oh, uh, new share, there we go, sorry. Um, that's this one, there we go. Can you see that one? Yeah. So um, that's kind of the story. And like, I really wanted to just show people that um, just because you've experienced homelessness does not mean that you have to suffer and sit in that. Um, I wanted to make sure that there was a voice being heard for a lot of people. Um, I moved on to become a shelter manager thereafter where I operated the largest shelter, what I know of um, at that time was uh, 200 people. Uh, there were also 40 pets. I also uh, managed 60 staff members. <laughs> um, it was a large, large task, but I, I can't tell you that I was, I was disappointed in it. It is really hard and, and try and work, but um, I ended up, doing some housing advocacy work and we helped with the housing bond measure which was 26-179 uh, you may know um, one of the um, one of the flyers that went around in Multnomah County was this one <laughs> that's me and my youngest daughter <clears throat> who was born premature. She was two pounds or four pounds and two ounces. And she wasn't supposed to be here, but <clears throat> she is. And she's as bratty as ever now. <laughs> uh, but um, they, they give me a huge reason to continue to uh, shoot for housing advocacy and they've never seen me in that light, but I can sit here and I can say that I'm a better person because of them. Um, through all of that, um, it's just been an amazing journey just to be here and just be present because um, all too often, I think that we forget what that looks like. I also um, had joined uh, the Mental Health Addictions and uh, Certification Board of Oregon by becoming a certified recovery mentor. I've been a certified recovery mentor since 2014. Um, and on top of helping with the bond measure or the, the housing measure, we also passed um, with the help of voters, the SB 608, which was also another uh, bond measure that was really, really cool to be a part of. Um, I don't have a picture of that uh, congratulatory moment, but um, another feather in my hat that I was really proud to uh, kind of be a part of. I did skip one photo um, that I did want to make sure that I shown you folks too. Uh, we were featured in an article in Transition Projects newsletter where um, we were able to uh, be recognized for the hard work that uh, one of my former co-workers, Michelle, uh, And that is this photo a few months where we didn't really know what was going to happen. Um, all I know is that being in this journey with all the incredible people that I've been able to kind of do that, I've finally been able to live a, a life where I feel productive. I moved into... Um, the income development uh, role where uh, I put on two of the largest veteran held job fair events in the state. Um, we had 70 plus employers in one room. And, you know, just to be a part of just any of that is is incredible. Um, the next thing that I moved to, I'm in an H more of an HR role now, which is great. But one of the most biggest moments that I think that um, I'm really proud of is for my homelessness, I um, purchased a home two years ago, exactly two years ago, actually. 
and um, believe it or not, it was really awkward. I was telling my realtor, um, I got really emotional and they were like, I don't understand what's going on. What seems to be the issue? And I said, there's no issue. These are incredible tears of joy that seven years ago, <clears throat> I was sleeping in a shelter bed. <clears throat> and transition projects model is uh, transitioning from homelessness to housing. And that was the perfect definition. And homeownership is definitely not something that I thought I'd be doing um, at the age of 40. I guess I hit the mark. I'm right on track with everyone else. When I was, I was supposed to, I shouldn't have made it past 25 with the life that I had led. And I will be graduating college this year as well. I'll be the first, I'll be the first in my family. And I think that, um, My moms, all of them, I've got multiple moms do the, all the adoptions and stuff. I think that they would be really proud of me if they were here. I lost my mother, my biological mother. I found out on Mother's Day uh, three years ago, and then I lost my adopted mother uh, two years ago on Mother's Day as well. So Mother's Day is <clears throat> pretty rough, but Despite it all, I will say that um, I've remained to uh, stay in my sobriety. Sobriety is actually a huge, important task for me because if it wasn't for my sobriety, I wouldn't have been able to accomplish and appreciate any of those things that I've done. Now, uh, I'm gonna share another photo uh, because I think that I, I need to share this. Um, this is my life now. Um, <laughs> and um, one more just because well two more uh, I also get to do stuff like this now uh, which is wild <laughs> that was 18,000 feet in the air and uh I had the time of my life. I actually did that in a memorial. Uh, I don't know if anyone's ever seen the movie Bucket List, but um, uh, Jack Nicholson jumped out of a plane with uh, someone and I promised someone that I would jump out of a plane with them and they uh, unfortunately passed away. So I took them up with me and they still jumped. <laughs> and the last thing that I get to do now is, um, is this. Uh, which I think is a, an incredible thing too. I'm an obstacle course racer. And if any of you don't know what that means, it means a lot of mud and a lot of physical exertion and fire jumping. <laughs> um, I can't say what the, the resolution for homelessness is, but I can say that um, there's a lot of dedicated people, I being one of those, um, that will continue to speak up for those that um, need a voice because I think while we've experienced homelessness, we feel that we've lost that voice. I also know that um, it's not an easy road. I was um, diagnosed with some mental illness that um, I think I suffered my entire life and uh, medicated for a very long time. And now mental illness is under control, um, regular therapy sessions. And um, I think part of that, just having a loving home and a place to be able to kind of rest helps you be able to do that. And one thing that I have truly appreciated about um, working in this field is that there's a such thing as called the housing first model. And some people disagree with it, but I think that for me, if I wasn't put in a housing, I wouldn't have been able to focus a lot on the mental illness, uh, the addiction, 
um, any of the childhood trauma and things of that nature. And I think that a lot of folks um, who experience homelessness, if they're able to get into housing, they're able to kind of, that's one of the last things that they need to worry and focus on where they can start to focus on those undiagnosed mental illnesses or the continued suffering of the addiction. And um, I'm just really proud to, to be in this work and uh, be a part of it in any capacity, I think. And uh, we've worked with the joint office and you know we've worked with Human Solutions and we've worked with Central City Concern. And you know what? I, I take my hat off to the folks that have pioneered and done this stuff for a long, long time. And to be present in that now is truly an honor. So I don't know what the short answer would be for any of this, but thank you for everything that each and every one of you have done too. I am truly honored to work right alongside each and every one of you. So I appreciate it. Well, this mother says thank you. And I'm always around for you, kid. So please. I, I, before we go into questions from the um, outside, I, I want to say something that, especially in this last year that I've seen, we talk about essential workers and the staff that works in the field of housing and mental health addiction are incredible people. And I don't know right now, I mean, I worked in, the, worked in social services for 30 years and I have met some unbelievably dedicated, wonderful, brilliant people. And these three men that I'm looking at are three of them. I'm so proud to have known you all. And I know I've given you a hard time over the years. Oh, well, but you know, you, you, you rose more than I could possibly imagine. You are incredible, incredible. And again, the people that work with you, the people that work in the shelters, the people that work on the streets are unbelievable. And I don't know how they do it. I'm so proud of all of you. Um, thank you. Thank you for your hard work. And I'm not going to cry. Um, but I want to give you some time if you want to ask each other some questions or add on to what one of you have said. I want to give you some time to do that before we move on to um, outside questions. Anybody have any thoughts or wants to add? Oh, well, you're quiet. I, are you intimidated I, by me? What's, what is this? I'm only just, I just want to appreciate Jeff for you sharing so much about your personal story. Uh, it, I, you, you touched on so many of the things that Andy and I talked about, but made them real. And I think um, just invaluable, the work that you're doing and your willingness to share. So it's an honor to be working side by side with you. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. You know. Well, I, I, I've known Jeff for many years now, and I am proud of you. I'm proud of Andy and I'm proud of Mark for the work that you do. And, and just, again, I I'm, I'm wanna thank you before we move on. I really wanna thank you for the hard work. I know how hard it is. And please pass it along to all your staff and the people you work with and let them know how much we appreciate the work that they're doing. So we have, um, some questions. I, I, I started this by asking Mark, we had uh, um, a, an email, I got an email today about um, City Council member Dan Ryan and his plans for the future. Do you, can you expound on that a little bit and what, where he wants to go with this? Um, so I'm not sure exactly what email you're referring to, but just so everybody understands, um, the joint office is a joint office between the city of Portland and Multnomah County. And on the county side, um, I report to, to Chair Deborah Kafori. Um, on the city side, under the intergovernmental agreement that we have, I report to whoever is the housing commissioner. Um, and for quite a while, the mayor held the role of housing commissioner. Um, but most recently, that is a role that is now with Commissioner Dan Ryan, um, who's relatively new to council. 
So I, I'm, I report to, to him and, and what I do know is that he's got a very um, intense interest in realizing the kind of potential of this, this joint endeavor with, with the county through the joint office. Um, I, we're hearing, you know, it, that um, certainly from everybody on council that, that homelessness and, and houselessness is, is one of their top priorities. It definitely is for him. And so I know he's very interested in, in sort of convening around the questions of sort of where are we going? What is the potential of the, of the Metro measure? Um, and, you know, we have a lot of, of really well developed um, kind of spaces that we've created over the last five years through a home for everyone to also have these conversations. But I, I think with the Metro measure, there is an opportunity to, to sort of revisit some of those structures and the approaches and, and to kind of revitalize that, that work um, and build upon all the, the sort of success we've had in building out our, our response system over time. So my, you know, I, I can't speak for him um, at all, but, but I can say that, you know, he's certainly expressed to me his commitment to, to really realizing the, the, the potential that exists um, to build on what we've done and, and, and to sort of see in the Metro measure in particular, um, this, this opportunity to connect in particular, the, the homeless services and behavioral health worlds, um, a little more, um, explicitly because we, we know that a lot of folks are struggling with behavioral health challenges on our streets. And we do a lot of really important collaborative work with, with our health department now, but with this new resource, um, that that part of the, the system has been so chronically underfunded as well. We have an opportunity to really create some some good additional partnerships. So I, I think that's that's how he has has shared um, with me his goals. You know, we we were all around when I, I remember. You know, Bud Clark started his plan on homelessness um, when he was mayor. Gretchen, God bless the woman, was incredible. Gretchen for the work that she did. Eric Sten. Um, Nick Fish, Deborah's doing incredible work. I remember, and when Vera, Mayor Katz was around, and we, um, the issue of Dignity Village was the first camp site that was mentioned. It, 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 they're still living there. Is camping really an acceptable answer for us? What, you know, there are people in this, that don't understand the issue of camping on the streets. Can you help us explain, uh, understand that and give us a little more information on the camping and what the future looks like of camping? Well, I, so I think Andy can weigh in yeah. as well. I mean, but let me just say there's a difference between camping and, and what we're, we would call alternative shelter. So there's unsanctioned camping of which we have a lot right now and COVID has, has really had an impact. So you see a lot of people just kind of in in um, public spaces, relatively unregulated. We've done a lot to try to get craft services and hygiene and things like that to folks, but that's not that that in in the way that we think about it is not a form of shelter. Um, something like Dignity Village or Right to Dreams um, or the Kent Women's Village, those we really have worked hard to to think of as part of our sheltering strategy. And that means that we're investing in a certain level of day-to-day -day kind of care in those in those spaces. Um, but it also means that we're investing in connecting the people who live in those shelter programs, alternative shelter programs, um, to help them transition to housing, right? Because we don't want anyone living longer than they have to in any shelter environment because it isn't it isn't quality housing. Um, and that means we have to provide support through in-reach teams and rent assistance and all the things that we also have for the, in the larger shelters that Transition Projects runs. And so, you know, whatever, I, you know, there is a future for this kind of alternative shelter. We're, we're exploring a full range of options. We have the C3PO sites that were created as part of COVID. Those were initially tents. That's not really sustainable in the winter. So, you know, move to a, a, a better kind of structure for folks to live in. But again, it's still temporary. It's transitional. And we've got to make sure that we're investing the resources to keep it transitional for the people who are staying there, in part so that those folks can move into housing and end their homelessness, in part so that more people can benefit from that shelter capacity that we've created. Thank so, you, Mark. And Andy, you, you work with families. We're talking about children on the streets yeah. and camping. Can you talk about what's so, going on there? Yeah. Um, 
I mean, and in general, I'm not a huge supporter of, we, we just started doing some street outreach um, funded by, by Mark's office to um, reach families who are on the streets to try to bring them inside into the shelter and housing system. Um, but I would, I would start from the assumption that um, camping in, in general, no matter how structured or hygienic it's made, is probably not the best solution for families with children. But um, back in my prior career, I actually negotiated the first contract between the city of Portland and Dignity Village. And I was a skeptic. I didn't believe in, in organized um, structured camping. I, we, had, we have to do better. But I think I was coming at it from my own uh, middle-class bias about mm -hmm. what a home should look like, um, how it should be developed and how it should function. And I guess what I would say is I, I'm a convert. Um, really through this lens. Um, for most people, a home is about some combination of autonomy, the ability to make your own choice. What most people do when they get home, they change their clothes, they, they let it all hang out. If you're gonna get a little sideways, you often do it at home or you feel safest. Now we're all working from home, that's a whole other conversation. But some combination of autonomy, privacy and community. I hear a lot of people say people are refusing services, they're refusing housing, they're refusing shelter, they just wanna be on the streets. I, I, I read that differently. And I think what some people are choosing is their balance of community autonomy and privacy doesn't exist in group congregate shelters, doesn't exist in housing with a lot of rules. So I'm gonna make my own. We used to call those people pioneers and homesteaders. Now we call them, you know, whatever, adjectives uh, or descriptors get used on the street. So I am not a, a, a huge believer in the government investing heavily in camping, but I think in a reality where the economics of housing look the way those slides I shared look, and housing is out of reach for more people than our programs can reach. If some people for some period of time can make it on their own or even better with a small amount of help, access to toileting and showering facilities, um, access to a place to cook food. We're seeing some real innovation happening on the streets and sweeping those camps out of the way um, and not supporting them, I think is, is just shooting ourselves in the foot. When we can say we have enough housing that everybody can afford what these panelists, our panelists here tonight might call a conventional home, great. Then we can say, let's enforce the zoning code and, and, and not have camping. Um, certainly camping that's disruptive, camping that involves, I, I draw a line between lawlessness and homelessness. So folks who are breaking laws, acting in ways that are violent and really antisocial, we need a solution for that. And to me, that's a, 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 big, a big role of the housing first uh, development. But while we're, housing takes time to develop and while we're taking that time, shelters work for some folks, but you know, shelters don't work for a lot of people and sometimes these group camps can. Um, so um, we always say we wanna be led by the voices of people who've been most impacted. A lot of folks are saying, I can make it on my own out here with just a little bit of help and I'm pleased to see um, the joint office and local government stepping up to invest in that. I think we need to be clear, is that a long-term investment, a mid-term investment or a short-term investment? Is it alternative shelter? or is it actually the homes that people are um, considering them to be making? I, I think we just have to have some clarity about that and clarity about what the rules are and clarity about where that's gonna happen and when it's not gonna happen. Thank you. There is this conception, this conception out there that, and you touched on it a little bit here, people like living on the streets. We, we have this, uh, this has been, I've heard for years, well, they don't, people don't want to go into the shelter. They don't want to go in housing. They like living on the streets. You know, shelter is a quest, is questionable. I know we had, um, it was a time period. There were expectations, there were rules. It's not easy. Is it true that people choose the street because they like it? Can I mention something? Yeah, please. I uh, run in the, the largest shelter. One thing that I had noticed was that there are people who have pets. Uh, there are people who have significant others. Uh, yes, there's rules and things of that nature, but um, if that meant this person that I've been with for 10 years and I need to separate from them, 
in order to move into this shelter and they also need to go and move into these other shelter when that's been the whole basis of their support system that is not something that they are 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 willing to do i mean it's let's be honest if you only had one person in your life and you were told that you need to leave them and not only leave them for a substantial amount of time but who knows if these other things are going to happen and then you add the fact that if someone has say a an animal um, they're not able to take that animal but that animal that has been the protector for them for an extended period of time and that's their family now it's not about wanting to live outside it's because there are a multiple amount of sacrifices that they need to make in order to make that move sometimes and giving up my family in order for this to happen doesn't seem realistic for me. And sometimes living in the now is the only thing that we can do. And I know for me, when I experienced my homelessness, I rented space on a couch in a drug house and it was one small cushion, but that's all I could do at that present moment in time. And I was willing to de deal with it for the time being, but I've slept in parks, I've slept in cars, and you know, you have to do what you need to do. And I think that what gets lost is uh, there are some people that choose to, but they choose because there are a lot of rules. And as Andy was saying, that autonomy. And, you know, I can't do that right now because I need to get my basic needs met. And living under these roof doesn't seem like this is going to be something that I'm able to do right now. You know, there's just, there's not a lot of housing out there that advertises, you know, one bedroom, 700 a month, heroin use inside, okay. Um, so if I'm someone who uses heroin on a regular basis, and it's a lot of what we see for folks who are outside, I'm not going to go into the conventional housing system and find a place for me to be. And anybody who knows anything about addiction knows I'm not going to say, oh, I'll stop using next week when I get my key. It just doesn't work that way. So mm -hmm. we need housing in which people can use heroin and, and make a choice from a place of stability. Uh, I'm going to choose to get treatment, or I may not, or I may relapse. But in all of that, I don't lose my housing. Um, you know, if, if, if I were a person suffering from addiction and had a relapse and damaged things in my house, dug up my front lawn, did whatever, my mortgage company wouldn't come tomorrow and say, we're canceling the mortgage. My housing is separated from my behavior as long as I'm able to pay that mortgage. When rental tenancies begin to look like home ownership, even if the finances aren't the same, we may see more people choosing a housing system that better accommodates behaviors that they're not ready to change or not in a position to change. Yeah, I, I'll just say, I, I think both of those just go to the point that if someone, if we're engaging someone who is trying to survive outside and we offer them service and they say no to that, we've got to ask ourselves whether we're offering the right service, right? It is, it is a function, we need to be reevaluating our systems of care and how we deliver services and whether we're actually meeting people at the point they are in their lives and in their journey. It's, it's not about living outside being a, a, a good thing or an easy thing or a desirable thing. And, and that's the challenge, right? Is to, to resist the temptation to say, we offered, you said, no, you must be service resistant or not want help. It is all about what it is that we're coming with and how we are coming to people and whether we're honoring their need for autonomy and the ability to direct their own path. And if we, if we don't honor that, we will get nowhere with folks. So I, I think that's ultimately what we have to do. I, I've been taking some questions that um, Nancy is sending me. So I'm trying to keep track here. I know you're getting some from the chat and she's sending them to me as well. Can you discuss and talk a little bit about the shelter to housing plan for the city? Um, and, and is there any way that the league can be supportive and help you? I'm going to do this quickly. Um, encourage people to, to read up on it a little bit more. Um, for those who don't know, it's a set of code changes that are being considered by the city that will facilitate the siting, um, among other things, facilitate the siting of shelter um, and a range of shelter types, both congregate style shelter um, and village or, or alternative style shelter. 
it really works to um, increase the number of zones within which you can site shelter and allows for um, uh, additional capacity in those in those shelters. There are also provisions there that address tiny houses, um, sort of the, the uh, small homes on wheels. Um, there are some provisions in there around single room occupancy type of households and, and facilitating more shared housing arrangements and things like that. So um, it is a really important set of, of changes. I think it, it meets the needs of our community right now. Um, I, there's been some concern that it, it is focused on trying to move shelter capacity into, into East Portland. That's not the intent of it. Um, it actually opens up just a range of, of sites around the community and certainly in our office and a lot of the shelter development runs through our office in this community. We are very mindful of geographic distribution. We are very mindful of bringing shelter capacity to communities that don't have it because we know we have people experiencing homelessness all over. Um, not just the city, but the county as a whole. Um, and so these, these, these code changes are really um, creating the possibility uh, for, for shelter siting. And then the decisions around where shelter goes is, is gonna be driven by, by where we see the need and where we don't currently have enough capacity. So um, it will come before council. I think there'll be opportunities for people to give testimony um, as, as part of that. And certainly there are opportunities to write in. So I would encourage folks to, to take a closer look at it. Jeff, I think there was a question that was just directed to you. Do you, do you have the chat open? Yeah, I have it. Okay. Um, I didn't see anything specific to me, okay. but um, I did so, mention something about uh, volunteers. I did see something in there. Someone was asking for, uh, can they speak to opportunities, uh, community of volunteers that get involved with your efforts? I sent them a link to the um, uh, Transition Projects volunteer site so they can look at that. And I was going to send them, if you're looking to get involved in work, I could also send you the job site. <laughs> Andy, there's a question for you as well, I think here. And I'm not getting, I'm only getting the ones from uh, Nancy. Did you see a question there for you, Andy? I didn't well, see any me, specific question. Okay, let me ask you this. Where, where, where the, I, I, you know, I know how, um, how the initiative came for Mark, the work that you're doing and the demand from the federal government to say we had to work together, which I thought was fine. Where does the state fit in on this? So the state, in the past has had a pretty limited role in, in homeless services in particular. Uh, the, the state has funded more broadly and the network of anti-poverty organizations, the community action agencies with um, some rent assistance funds, uh, weatherization funds, things like that. Over the last couple of years, that's really started to shift. I think as the, as the housing crisis, but also the homelessness crisis has become more statewide. Um, and we've seen you know, Oregon rank uh, in some cases worse in the nation and in, in rates of homelessness and unsheltered homelessness, um, the, the urgency at the state level has really grown. And so now we're seeing the state invest at the Oregon Housing, the, at Oregon Housing Community Services in a, in a homeless team um, that's much bigger now than it was. They're putting a lot more resources out into the community and doing more convening of, of the necessary policy conversations so that it's, it's not just of what is Multnomah County doing, or even what are Washington Clackamas and Multnomah County doing? But what are what is the state as a whole doing to to lead in our in our efforts to address address homelessness? Because it is showing up in rural communities, in small towns, in big cities. Um, it has been, and I think it's just it's now at that point where um, the, at the state level, it's really starting to get the attention that it needs. And, yeah, I want to. Oh, can I? Add, Portland has. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Andy. I'm sorry. Yeah, I just want to jump in and 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 add to that. So, where the state has a really primary role, as well as the city of Portland, is uh, Oregon Housing Community Services and the Portland Housing Bureau uh, together administer millions of dollars annually in funds that are used to uh, capital construction of affordable housing. And I mentioned um, in my remarks that I, I think too often we disconnect that. Um, pipeline of housing that is being publicly built from the issue of homelessness. 
And we're starting to build more connections, but I'll say it from my organization's experience, when we transition homeless individuals or families into housing, we have two places they can go. A very limited supply of what I call conventional affordable housing that receives a government subsidy to be developed or out into the private market with rent assistance and services. I can tell you that the families who remain stable longer and feel more attachment to their housing are living in um, social sector developed affordable housing. Too much of what we're developing is not really affordable. I think a lot of folks who are coming out of homelessness look at the rents that we have to charge because of the funding we receive from the state when we build a building and say, I could never afford that. And so again, I'm gonna make a, 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 an advocacy pitch that if we are gonna put more um, of our rent assistance resources into uh, embedded within the affordable housing we're developing. That housing comes uh, into being complete with services for residents already attached, um, leases that are very pro-tenant um, and protective of renters' rights. And I just think it, it's, it's, it's a really important uh, opportunity that we could leverage. So the state and the city play a big role there. You know, we were, there, there was a question, it, we, I think we've run out of time, but there was a question in, in the safety net you know, and the, pan the pandemic now with the issue of people not being able to pay rent is just exasperated the, I mean, never, we've never seen anything like this. So the safety net that, that the state has or that we have um, has to be enhanced. But thank you, I wanna thank you all so much for this and I'm gonna send it back. You are, again, please thank, thank everybody that you work with. I, I know how hard it is and I appreciate all the work that you've done. Debbie Kate. Thank you, Doreen. And thank you so very much, Jeff, Andy, and Mark. It was a stimulating and very informative discussion about such an enormous topic. We appreciate the critically important work that you do to alleviate the challenges for people experiencing houselessness and help them move toward housing and services. You are offering hope to so many who need it. The League of Women Voters is a membership organization. We would be happy to welcome those watching tonight and your friends to join with us if you're not yet a member. And we would also value your support in presenting these and future informative programs. In March, we will address some of the issues relevant to climate change. We only take on the really big ones. Please see our membership and donor information pages at lwvpdx.org. This is Debbie Kay, President of the League of Women Voters of Portland. Thank you very much for joining us for this presentation. I think perhaps the salutation for the moment may be, may you get your vaccination soon. Please take care, stay safe. Good night. <laughs>